What is going on, spectators? Welcome back to episode 140. It is June 6th, 2022. My name is Julian, and I am here with my partner, Brooklyn. What's going on, brother? What's going on is I feel like I haven't been here in a good little minute, so it's good to be back. <laughs> it definitely does feel that way. I think, what, the last two? Or uh, two of the last three we had you MIA, so... Um, yeah. It, has, it does feel like it's been a little minute, but uh, welcome back. Thank you, and, thank you. Uh, well, you know, welcome back to the pod. for Long-time listener, first-time caller. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we got a lot to talk about today. We got the playoffs going on, first and foremost, right? NBA mm-hmm. finals are happening. We're two games into that. We get the NHL, fi- or not finals, but conference finals going on right now, which we are surprisingly invested into. As you guys know, this is a very big hockey pod. and uh, The biggest. The biggest hockey pod, maybe in the entire South Florida region, potentially, maybe. Um, but we've been watching a lot of hockey, and then as as we do, the MLB has been fantastic for us in particular. So uh, shout out to the Yankees, and uh, shout out to just baseball being really really fun this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, <clears throat> for the most part, people have been healthy, and a lot of the good players have been good. Uh, for anybody interested, uh, the softball NCAA World Series is going on right now. I haven't really been paying attention too much, but if you are sick, that's going on. Just want to let you know. And uh, baseball is getting to that point, too. I think uh, the regionals are about to start over there in baseball. So a lot of playoff sports are happening right now. That's the you know the, the end of spring jam. And Brick, where do you want to start with? I mean, let's talk about playoffs. Let's dive into hockey real quick. Do a little face-off with that because we ain't going to be on that too, too long. The face-off. But I mean... Go Rangers. Yeah, How go Rangers. It? Who yeah. would have thought that we would have been going into game three against Tampa Bay Lightning, back-to-back champs? We would have been going up 2-0. Who would have thought that? Because I for sure didn't. 2-0, and it definitely could have been 3-0 last night's game. Uh, yeah. It was a wild one. It was like the most fast-paced game I've seen in a while. And, you know, we're not we're not crazy big into hockey around here. We've been watching these playoffs, though, just because the Rangers are there. It's really fun to watch the Lightning. Like, being in Tampa with the Lightning are good is really fun, right? We're going to try and go to the game tomorrow. Not to the game, but, like, to the stadium outside the game tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can do that. Who knows? Um, But the environment's really fun, and Tampa is a hockey town. So, playing against the Lightning is a really good time. The Rangers were 5-0 and against the Lightning coming into this game. No. Wind up losing 3-2. Power plays have been really big for both teams. Like, for whatever reason, we can't stay out of penalties. And this matchup is really interesting because it's two of probably the best goalies in the league facing off against each other. We thought it was going to be really low scoring. Like, people kind of expected 2-1, to 2-0, one, 1-0 nothing, one nothing games. 6-2, 3-2, 3-2. Just a lot of goals being scored. Uh, more than the other series, certainly. Yeah. I think it's just how fast paced the game is kind of moving. Like these two teams are attacking each other really, really hard. And um, the keepers are keeping up for the most part, but there's only so many shots you're going to save. They're they're trying their absolute best, bro. (laughs) And like you said, uh, it's fast paced and it was getting tough. And you saw it towards the end of that game. Both teams just look gassed. Yeah. They're out there running and gunning and, they were giving it all, and they were, it was getting so sloppy in that third period for the Rangers specifically that, like, they just looked like jello. Everything was – they were losing every single 50-50 puck, just sloppy on some um, collects that they would have normally just took it, started rolling, and it was looking tough, and the Lightning took advantage of that. They – they mustered up whatever nonsense they needed to, and they got a late goal with, I think, like, what, 40 46? 47, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, it, it. and the Lightning's, like, experience kind of came into a, a factor there. Yeah. You know, Palat wound up with the game winner, and uh, Stamco mm-hmm. scored, Kucherov scored, Kucherov had a, a really big assist there. And those are their veterans. Those are the guys they expect to get points out of. And uh, when it kind of mattered at the end there, it, they showed up. 
And, uh, you know, the Rangers are a really young team. Like, this is their first time being in the playoffs at all as a unit outside of Chris Kreider. They're mm-hmm. really, really young. And so this game in particular was definitely like a veteran ship. Like, we're going to grind this out. We've been here before kind of a game. So that's about as much NHL analysis as you're getting out of me. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're, we're doing the best. We're yeah. doing the best we can. The, um, we, we're fighting our demons with that. <laughs> We're trying, man. The Avalanche are absolutely rocking Edmonton, too. So um, Yeah, I'm, I'm fully expecting that to be a sweep. I can't give you any reason why. I just, I've seen the a couple of games from the Avalanche now. They're nuts. They have, like, the best no. scoring defense I've ever seen. Which yeah. doesn't and say shout much. out to Edmund, Edmonton <laughs> but, on game one. Like, they were going back and forth. That game was nuts. Like, I think the final score was, like, 7-6, to six, if I'm not eight, mistaken. 8-6, six, 8-6. Eight, 8-6, six. Eight, six, even better. Yeah, they got an empty netter. Even better. So that just showed what was going on there. And I thought this series was going to be a just slugfest. And then the last two games. Not so much. Avalanche poured it on there. All pun intended. Yeah. And, you know, I, like I said, the Avalanche defense are really, really quick and like are really capable scorers, which makes it really tough to defend a team that any five on the ice at any time could give you a goal. <clears throat> no. So, yeah. Hockey. Nice. Look at the spectators go. We're nuts. Go We're Absolutely nuts. Now, for something we know a little bit more about, the NBA Finals are going on. The NBA Finals are going on. We got the Golden State Warriors versus the Boston Celtics. They have these games pretty spread out. So we had our first game on Thursday and the second game yesterday. Yeah. It's a lot of time off. Uh, yeah. A lot of time to game plan and change up. And we kind of saw that. Game one and game two were very, very different. Um, game one was a really tight game. The Warriors were up 10, 11 in the fourth quarter. And the Celtics just decided they weren't going to miss again. <laughs> they don't miss, man. Yeah, he's good. He's good. No, he don't miss. Al Horford popped off, and they went on like a 40, 41 to 10 run or something of that nature. Game one was like the epitome of what these playoffs have been this year. Just some team gets a run, and the other team absolutely just breaks down. And speaking of breaking down, with six minutes and 30 seconds left, the Warriors had 101 points. The final score of this game, the Warriors finished with 108 points. The Warriors, the Golden State Warriors with the Splash Bros and their new little puddle friend. Pool? Jordan Poole. Poole? <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> but um, seven points in six and a half minutes for the Warriors. That's unheard of. In the NBA Finals. Pretty bad. Pretty damn bad. And like you said, that's breakdowns and just runs. That's been the NBA playoffs. Yeah, and I mean, it's hard when like the team you're playing shoots 51% from three, right? You don't expect Al Horford to shoot 75%. You're not expecting to get 26 out of him, right? And, uh, you know, uh, Derek White giving you 21. Like, that's just not what you're expecting. Derek White on five for eight three point shooting, too. Yeah. And I mean, he they, that's why they got him right there. The reason they got Derek White is because they needed extra offense. No. And, uh, you know, he's kind of been spurty, and sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. But the interesting thing about game one is that Tatum was actually very good despite not shooting well. And that was like a really impressive thing for me to see. Now you better shoot better. You can't be shooting three for 17 because you'll get the one game out of me. And I'll tell you, he did play well, especially at the end. Like he became like a dominant facilitator and it was like kind of impressive to see. I think it was what 13 assists was like the most ever for somebody's debut in a finals. Yeah. Um, So pretty cool little tidbit there but three for 17 is absolutely unacceptable and they just he got lucky that they won this game so that he didn't get crucified the only reason i'm not crucifying him is because they wound up winning by double digits and he was facilitating and making those easy shots at the end of the game so yeah absolutely 100 percent agree right there and then i mean especially having a bounce back game in game two that helps a lot to not get slandered over here on the slander pod <laughs> here's the so. thing though I'm going to slander him because game two, he has his 28 points, right? Let's move over to game two, right? Because game one, again, 
Draymond said it best. Al Horford and Derek White are not going to shoot the way they did in game one every game. That's just not the way it's going to be. No. So Draymond went and, on his and, spot And just the, the Horford uh, three-point shooting, just so we get that out in the air. Six for eight. Yeah, like, that's just not going to happen. That's not no. going to happen. And, you know, we yeah. can chant all playoffs long. The Celtics aren't going to get help all playoffs. And they have been, for the most part. But they're actually not. Like, that's not going to happen. And game two is a perfect example of it, right? Game two. Tatum becomes Jason Tatum again. He has 28. He shoots like a little under 50%, like 40-something percent. And 42. good. Nice. Awesome. Mm-hmm. You get 5 for 17 out of Jalen Brown, 4 for 13 out of Derek White, 2 for 7 out of Peyton Pritchard, 1 for 6 out of, <laughs> out of Marcus Smart. But you guys just shot so poorly. And then on top of that, you want to you wanna add to that. They had 19 turnovers. The Celtics have looked really, really good at times. And then there's games like this yesterday where you're like, man, that team really was under 500 at some point this season. Yeah. Because there's just times where they can't shoot. And there's times where the Celtics look like a lottery team when they try and, like, run offense that's, like, uncomfortable to them. Right. And what I mean by that is like, you know, they have their sets and sometimes they, they play a lot of iso ball, especially with Tatum and they play like a one, two man game. And then that kind of leads to open shots, especially when Tatum's making those really tough shots. Like he was last night, he was making really tough shots, like overly tough. He was making the shots that like he had no business taking because nobody else was hitting anything. So he had to just yeah. take very contested shots. And when they're in those types of offenses where they're a little uncomfortable and Tatum's hitting them, but nobody else is. This team looks horrible. And they start throwing a ball to the defense and throwing a ball out of bounds and turning it over. 19 turnovers in a finals game is unacceptable. That's just the bottom line. You're not going to win any game at any level with 19 turnovers. And the crazy part, this game was very winnable. It was very winnable. Like, the Warriors stars outside of Steph were horrible last night. Clay went four for 19. Four for 19? I think he had two points going into halftime. He finished with 11. Wiggins was four for 12. I think Poole was like 30%. Like, these guys were not good. No. They were bad. And, and like, the Warriors had a good amount of turnovers, too. It wasn't 19. But Jordan Poole, outside of a <laughs> – I saw actually a funny TikTok, and it was like – Jordan Poole, when his one move in the bag doesn't work, because he does, like, a triple threat at the top of the uh, three-point line, and then he does, like, a step back. And if that doesn't, like, put the defender back and get separation, like, he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> and then that happened twice in this game, and he got, like, no separation but put the shot up anyway and made it. And it was just like, <sighs> he made, like, a half-court shot, doing the worst bag ever. Yeah. Took a step back and hit the half-court, and we're like... I guess, man. <laughs> but uh, six for 14 is what it was. Uh, that's just not really helping your team. And even Steph didn't shoot, like, particularly well. He was uh, nine for well, nine for 21, so he had, like, an okay game. Yeah, again, one, one, one short of 30. So but, like, if you get anything from your supporting cast on the Celtics – literally anything because they got nothing no. like <laughs> two points from three of like your top guys Horrible. each unacceptable embarrassing if you get just a little bit out of them this is a close game and maybe somebody hits a big shot down the stretch yeah and now you you maybe take a 2-0 lead on the warriors yeah and one of the crazy things too like this game was the ultimate wow neither team <clears throat> played well and the warriors ran away with it and that scares me. That really scares me because the Warriors like, ran away with it when they weren't playing well. Like yeah, that's, exactly, they they played like pretty poorly, and like you know, Steph made some big shots, but like they did not play like the Warriors last night. Their defense was fantastic. I mean, holding them to eighty eight. Also, big shout out to uh to Gary Payton the second. Uh, he he got that really bad injury in the the Memphis series, and now he's playing. I think he put up like 25, 25 or twenty six minutes last night. And played, like, very annoying defense and, like, held Jalen Brown down. And, like, he's been a great defender, and that's what he brings to this team. Like, he's not really, like, a great scorer by any means. He was efficient. I don't think he missed a shot. 
And uh, it's nice to see him back on the court and, like, actually helping. 25 minutes is a lot for a dude who um, was hurt, like, a week, like three weeks ago. So, shout out to him. But big shout out. one of the big storylines in this game, too, was the whole Draymond issue, right? So, yeah. it came out after the game that the refs were pretty much saying they didn't give him another technical because he already had an existing one. And they wanted to, like you know, not put it into their hands to get him out of the game. He had that scuffle with Jalen Brown, right? Uh, he, like, tries to pull his pants down. They get in each other's face. There's some pushing and some <laughs> shoving. Draymond already had a technical, and they don't give him another one there. And this doesn't change the outcome of the game, right, at all. Like, the Celtics were still horrible. They still turned the ball over too many times. One or two things don't really change the game all too much for them. But there needs to be, like an accountability factor taken in where we can't be changing the way we're refing and calling results just because a guy might get ejected. Yeah. Like, that like obvious, make- obviously in the playoffs, you don't want to call nitpicky fouls and, and like you want to let them play and not get them out of the game for stuff like that. But if it's there, you're not going to call it because if I call this right now, he's gone. That, that shouldn't be your thought process. At all. Because if it happens, you have to call it. If it's, like, borderline and it, it doesn't really need to be called, okay, you don't call it. But you don't look at it as, if I call this right now, he's gone. As a ref, that shouldn't be the case. Like, you're calling it play to play. Whatever happened earlier in the game or games past, it, it don't matter. You, you got to call what you see. And also, like, it's it's almost the opposite, right? With a guy like Draymond, who has a history of technicals, he's missed finals games because yeah. he's gotten too many technicals in the se- in the series in the season. No. This is a guy that you need to watch extra hard. And you know, this is no diss to Draymond. Like, uh, obviously, like he's a pest. I mean, you can't getting... you can't diss it when that that's literally what it is. Yeah, I mean, he's trying to get under their skin, and like you know, he's a reactionary guy, uh, especially in the moment, and he likes to you know amplify a situation sometimes, but. Like, he has done these things in the past. And some of the technicals he's gotten in the past are worth it. Most of them are. Some of them are a little bit over-exaggerated. But when you're a guy who's done this in your career, you tend to get more because you get the, the eye of scrutiny on you, right? And for them to kind of do the opposite is very odd. And, um, yeah, I don't know. NBA rig confirmed? NBA rig confirmed. I, that's kind of how the Celtics were feeling last night, too. I, I, There's a lot of Celtics Twitter just like, the fouls, the fouls, the fouls. And it's like, yeah, the fouls, but you lost by 19. Yeah, and I, I saw on Twitter. And, and you like, shot 37%. People, like, the fouls didn't make you miss all those threes. Like, that's not what happened. Yeah, people posting on Twitter, just the best player, and it's a picture of a ref uniform. Like, you can always blame the refs any given game. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be something. Go out and ball. If you're balling, it doesn't matter. If you shoot 45%, the refs aren't an issue. Yeah, like, obviously, some there's games where you got to fight against the refs. Like, that that happens. Absolutely. In a close game. Get it close, and then maybe you can complain about the refs and a call going either way. If you're getting blown out, that's not the ref's fault. No. That, it's, it's just not. They, they miss a... You step out of bounds or a... Any type of call, and it's a two to four point game. Okay, yeah, it's their fault. Scott Foster, you're terrible. Horrible. No, but <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a really easy cop out, and I don't. It, it's as a so fan, does it make you feel better? I don't know. It's never made me feel better. I've never once felt better about blaming an umpire, blaming a ref, blaming a. I feel worse because now it's not your fault. It's an outside force that made you lose. Uh, it's never like made it's me terrible. Feel yeah, it's terrible. So, I don't know about y'all. I don't like it. I don't like it. But yeah, so that's we're tied up one to one, and it's kind of weird because again we're kind of crapping on Boston here, but they're going into Boston now with an advantage. They have home court the rest of the, the playoffs if they can win these next two games. They have home court, and that's a big thing to go into game one and take one from Golden State. But again. When you both play poorly and you just get blown out is not really the best of signs. But this is a seven-game series, and Boston's been through two before. There's no reason to overreact at all. I still think it's Warriors and Six, personally. 
But I mean, I, I do too because again, you're not going to get a game one Al Horford production. Every game. You're not going to get a game one Derek White production. You'll have Marcus Smart show up. You'll have Jalen. You'll have Tatum. That's fine. They all play their heart out. They they go off. You get what you're going to get from them. But now on the other side, you get the Warriors who haven't played particularly well. You get them playing well. And them at their best is a lot better than the Celtics at their best. And that's a scary thing for Boston. Yeah. But um, Boston being the defensive team, that that's going to be their strong suit. If they're not going to play well on on the offensive side, they better play lights out on defense and well, just and, completely stop them. And you know what needs to happen, too, for like the Warriors on their side? Jordan Poole is going into a extension year, right? It's not a contract year, but it's an extension year. He's finally eligible for it. He needs to play like a guy who wants to get a max extension. I don't know if I give Jordan Poole a max. And the max is like an easy thing to give out in the NBA, right? Like we give out maxes like it's candy because like there's a lot of money. There's not a lot of players. It's an easy thing to do. Jordan Poole very could be a max player. Very well could be. But like he needs to right play now? like that. He needs yeah. to play like that. And he really hasn't. Um, if he plays like a max player, but you know, we're not, that's not asking for 40. That's asking for efficiency and like a little bit of, that you know like helping out the team a little bit more than he kind of has um he's made the offense feel a little bit more stagnant than he has in the past so uh that's a credit to obviously the celtics defense their defense is incredible it's kind of hard to like you know crap on these guys when everybody who's they've played in the playoffs have shot career lows (laughs) or like playoff lows when they're playing the celtics because that's a credit to them but no the the celtic team they're all respect to them their defense is just top notch this year, and you you got to give credit to them. Yeah. So going into when is game three? Is game three on Wednesday? Uh, game game three is on Wednesday. Man, dude, there's so much time in between these games. Bro, if this series goes seven, game seven is June nineteenth. It's, it's June sixth right today. Now. Yeah, I saw somebody saying, and this is a That's little horrible. tangent, but like. The World Series, you could finish it off in, what, like two weeks? The the NBA Finals, you're running four weeks. Like three and a half. But, like, you're – that's wild. Well, for the Finals itself, yeah. This is what they started. They started on the second. So, it's 17 days se- from, the, yeah. from game one to game seven. 17 days. That's a lot. You don't yeah. need that much time. You don't need that much time. I mean, the way the NBA looks at it, too, it's like we're getting the best version of these players by giving them these days off. I guess that's fair, but it's a long time, bro. It is, especially when, like, game three to four, there's only one off day. And then, like, game one to two, and then two to three, there's two in between both. Yeah, and, and you know, to stay on that tangent, you mentioned the World Series. They couldn't do this in the World Series. If they did this in the World Series... It would be really bad because you're getting Garrett Cole four times. You're getting oh, yeah. Rob four times. That's and the thing is with baseball, like obviously it's a lot less energy exerted because you're basketball. You got to run up and damn down so many times that you need to rest your legs. Yeah, baseball, and it, and it's you can go out there too. And yeah. yeah, baseball, you can go out there back to back nights and like have the same energy you did, especially for a World Series. Yeah. Yeah. So you just give them the day off and baseball, you give them too many days off. Like you're hurting the team. Yeah. Rest isn't necessarily the greatest thing when it comes to baseball. Cause if you're hot, you want to be playing. Yeah. You don't want a day off and cool down. Well, basketball, it, like it's easy to get your shots up. Yeah. Like you're going to shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that's not going to change. You can't replicate in game pitching. Yeah. As much well, as you try to, like yeah, it's really hard to. Like you can, you can see a ball, you can do some BP, but that's not doing a whole lot. But like again, no. ima- imagine you had seventeen days between game <clears throat> one and game seven, you would just run a two man rotation, right? You would run your two yeah. best. So if you face the Mets in the, the World Series, you're seeing the Grom Scherzer, the Grom Scherzer. That's that's insane because you could do that. 
Three days in, no. three days in between each game. That's six days rest. No. <laughs> Man. That that's tough. Game five, really seeing the Grom for the third time. Oh, brother, that would be so bad. Bro. I mean, like, <laughs> imagine that would like, kill the game even more than what it already is. Imagine, also, like, MLB Bombard. going seventeen days for a series would kill the sport in its own. <laughs> Dude, the Yankees have a day off today, and I'm like scratching my neck. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, where are the Yankees? I need baseball. I I do. <laughs> I need baseball. That's you know the best what? team in baseball, Yankees, at that. And you know what? That's the crazy part about that. We're one-third of the way through the MLB season. A full third of the way. And we get to figure out who were the best teams. Because at this point, we have a pretty good glimpse of who's good, right? It's it's like a pretty solid... What is it? A sample size, right? Like, all the samples you're seeing of players are starting to be like, okay... That still might not be sustainable, but that is a good sample. Like, this isn't like, oh, it's one month into the year. No, 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 no. We are a third of the way. We are 50 games in. Yeah. We're almost 50 games in. We're close. I know, we're 55, 56 games in. Like, this is, we are in here. We are into it's the crazy. dog days. The summer is coming, and the All-Star game is around the corner. So what I want to talk about, you just said the Yankees are the best team in baseball, and I'm going to have to agree. No. But I want to talk about the power rankings in the MLB, right? The Yankees are 39 to 15. So we're not going to talk too much about the Yankees because we, we watch the Yankees a lot, right? I think if you're watching the sport at all, you know they're the best team in baseball right now. Mm-hmm. They have, like, the starters, their five rotation, all five of their starters are in the top 20 in the RA. All five of them, including Nestor Cortez leading the league, Jameson Tyone at 11th. Like, come on. Those are the two guys you don't expect. You thought it was going to be Garrett Cole. He's third on that team. And he's also having a fantastic season with a 2.04 ERA, by the way. Um, Then you have Aaron Judge coming in. He has 21 home runs. He's on pace for 64 home runs. Aaron Judge is on pace for 64 home runs. That's going to break the American League record. That's going to break the record for home runs by a non-steroid user. It'll break the Yankee record. And he's probably, at this point, the MVP of the league. I know Jose Ramirez has been fantastic for the Guardians. Um, Mike Trout's on an 0 for 28 skid, and he still has a, uh, what is it, like a 389 OPS. So Mike Trout and the Angels and their just implosion have been ridiculous. What is it, 11 straight losses? 11 straight losses for the Angels. Especially after last night where they play the Phillies, and they're up. Five nothing, and Jews making a graphic. He's like, we're, I we're said gonna they were gonna the... lose eleven. I said they were gonna lose that game. I yeah, said and I was it. like, just just hold off, put it, do the ten now because they're up five nothing in like the fifth inning. They're looking good right now. Bryce Harper hits a grand slam. They end up walking it off with a three run homer. Bryson Stott, rookie, yeah. walks it off. By the way, so end up walking it off and. We get the Jeff Passan Nodi on Twitter. Oh, Angels. Oh, Angels. It's Shout terrible. out our boy Jeff. Because that's bad. Bad. Really bad. And you know what? They're not in the top five of the power ranking. No. They're just, they're just, they're, they're just simply not. They're simply not. No. So who's your fifth best team in the MLB right now? My fifth best team? Um, I'm liking the Padres. Liking the Padres and what they've been able to do this year, their pitching, I mean, they're, they're the fifth best um, pitching team in terms of uh, ERA, win-loss. They are uh, they got the fourth most um, the shutouts, yeah. And uh, they're looking good. They they got the um, – they're third in the league in hits, sixth in the league in um, earned runs. Uh, six in the league in strikeouts. They're looking good. And, I mean, they've impressed me on the offenses, offensive side, not having Tatis this year. That's Because I, I really thought that was going to just end them. They're uh, one of the best teams in uh, defensive runs saved. And I'm liking what San Diego's doing. So I got them five. 
Yeah, and San Diego is interesting too. They have Manny Machado, who's like an MVP candidate this year. He has really yeah. lifted the load for the Padres, uh, despite yeah. not having Tatis. Tatis should be coming back at some point too, so this team will get significantly better uh, whenever he does come back. So I'm not uh, mad at that at all. I'm going to go ahead and put the Brewers at number five for me, though. I love the Brewers. Corbin Burns is having another Cy Young season. He is looking just Ooh. disgusting. Um, I know you got Sandy and Pablo over there in the NL, and they've been really good. Uh, Tony Gonsolin's been fantastic, too. Don't sleep on him, which we'll talk more about him and his team in a little bit. But I like the Brewers. I, I do think that they are still a suspect to get first round exited because their hitting is very raised like where it's team hitting and there's no like one particular guy, especially with Yelich uh, playing better, but still not that guy. Um, Adamas is hot and cold. Rowdy Telez has cooled off. So they have a lot of guys. They almost got no hit the other day by the Padres. Joe Musgrove almost threw his second no hitter as a Padre. Uh, Colton Wong broke that up though. There was a cool little moment between the two where like Colton just like, tipped his hat to Joe and Joe just like gave him a, a little wink and a kiss. And I was like, okay, that was awesome. But I like the Padres or not the Padres. The, I do like the Padres, but I like the Brewers number five for me. Uh, I think their division is so easy too that. Like they're going to just wind up being healthy and kind of like cruise into a central championship. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was um, going back and forth for uh, number five, but Brewers are my number six, so I'm not mad at that. Yeah. Um, number four, I'm going to – we'll snake draft this, right? Number four, I'm going to go Houston. The Astros are still the Astros, right? Uh, Justin yeah. Verlander has cooled off a little bit. He started off, and he was literally leading the league in every single pitching stat for the first uh, seven weeks. And I was like, wow, it's almost – it's almost like Justin Verlander is like – the best right-handed pitcher of our era. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it, who would have thought? I mean, outside of the ground, but like he's been around for longer too. So it's like, wow, who would have thought? Um, The Astros are just chugging along, man. I mean, Pena's cooled off a little bit, but Jose Altuve is just the, still the golden standard as a hitter at second base, making all the plays. Jordan Alvarez has just taken such a step up, even more so. Oh. If you look at his Savant page, it's like, the Red Sea, it's gross. Uh, Kyle Tucker is doing a little bit better than he was. Uh, the shift is really hurting Kyle Tucker, so I am scared to see what he's going to do next season without the shift because it is, like, really hurting him. Michael Brantley's Michael Brantley. Uh, Guriel is the one factor that's taken a really big step down. He's, like, finally starting to sow his age. Guriel's, like, 37, I think. Is he really? Yeah, he won a batting title last year, and, and he is simply not winning a battle title this year. And that's the issue with contact hitters. I will always say I don't love average. Because what happens to a hitter that hits for average the second they hit under 250? They, they're, they're just not good. It's kind of what's happened with Gurriel here. So, I like the Astros. Their pitching is fantastic, too. Framber Valdez is... Uh, and uh, they don't even have Lance McCullers yet. Like, if they do get Lance back, which I think he's expected to come back, their pitching gets even better. A little scary. Uh, Luis Garcia has been pretty good. Again, Verlander has been fantastic. He looked like a Cy Young for majority of the season. And uh, I don't know, man. Rafael Montero is a, a, a rising star as a reliever, too, which is pretty cool to see. So... Astros are scary, man. Number four for me. Yeah, and um, we won't say too long on number four because Astros are my number four, too. So, I mean, just to reiterate everything you said, <laughs> pitching's great. Jordan is just emerging more and more as a superstar in this league. Yeah. Jordan's and a top five hitter in baseball. It's awesome. Every, very scary one at that. Boy yeah. just got paid, too. So, I mean, yeah, and congrats to him. He just got an extension. Um, I do think he might have been worth more if he could play the field. Like, if Jordan could legitimately play left field, like, not at a liability level, uh, he would have made another 60 mil. But he can't. He'll be a DH within two years, like a full-time DH, and that's tough. But It's tough, it but it don't matter anymore. It don't, it don't matter. Like, hit the ball. It don't See matter. ball, hit ball. Yeah. He does that very well. <laughs> um, so. Number three, I think we're pretty much equal the rest of the way. Uh, number three is going to be the Dodgers. They had a tough week last week, and I don't want to overreact too much to a tough week, 
but they got swept by the Pirates. I think they are one and five against the Pirates. Uh, some teams just have it against her, right? Like that's just the way it goes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can't put a finger on it sometimes. So sometimes you go out against the Pirates, you don't win a game. Guess what? They're not going to have to play the Pirates in the playoffs. So who cares? Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Um, we do not it, care. <laughs> no, at all. But I mean, it's not It's not a great look. It's, you don't want to get swept by the Pirates. Uh, so it was a rough week for them. They're on a two-game losing streak. They were 5-5, five and five, lost 10. Uh, and they just split a series with the Mets, and that's kind of part of the issue too. Like they just faced off against the Mets in LA. The Mets don't have the Grom, they don't have Scherzer. They would have pitched in this series. That's the scariest part about this Met team. Yeah, and you want to just slide up to them, or you want to talk more about the Dodgers? I don't really care. No, nah, we we can slide up to the Mets. Yeah, Mets are number two. Because without those two, the Mets are just man. They're scary. That they're, they're, their offense right now, they're they're second in runs and first in hits, for whatever reason they're, they're first in triples too. That's wild. <laughs> but um, this Met team is one of the best I've seen in a while, and surprisingly, they haven't all the way meted yet. So Mets haven't met yet. They have not met yet. The fact that we're um six days into june and we're sitting here talking about the mets at the number two spot for the power rankings amazing pete's being a sneaky little demon over there and that boy keeps pace that's a contender <laughs> pete pete has 16 home runs and 54 rbis right now no and that's mostly because you know this is why rbis are a bad stat right he's hitting fourth and there's like, their team on base percentage is like 320 right there's always a guy or two on base. So every home run's like a three run homer. Home runs or RBI is not a great stat. But it's a nice number to look at. And that's translating the wins, having those extra RBIs. Uh, Pete's been a pretty consistent hitter this year. He's also hitting for average. It's yeah. all, he's like just under 300. Uh, Two, 283. Lindor is leading the team in a war. I think he's tied with a couple of people, but Lindor kind of working his way back to being a premier shortstop is really cool. Um, Jeff McNeil might be the surprise of a lifetime because Jeff McNeil this time last year had Mets and Mets Twitter, like begging for him to get deported, not traded, but deported. (laughs) And he's leading the team in average. I think he's leading the team in OPS or no, he's not. uh, Pete's leading the team in OPS. He's leading the team in war. And second base was kind of a concern for the Mets. That's why they were like, excited to get Cano back. But uh, McNeil's kind of hunkered down and become kind of the, the contact guy that we knew he could be. And it, it's been a weird career for him, but he's kind of having a great That's season been. to this point. Yeah, and one of, and one um, of the, oh, hold on, you got. No, I was just uh, throwing a nugget on your RBI and on base percentage for the Mets. They're first in both of them. In the league, so again, like that's why fifty four RBIs isn't as cool for Pete because it's like your team's on base every single time you're up. Every time you hit a home run, it's a two three. And and good thing this isn't a Pete Alonso uh, <laughs> power ranking. Oh no, team. He would, yeah, he would. Yeah, he'd be able to... <laughs> and they're they're a unit right now. They're an absolute unit. Yeah, and one of the cool stories of this year too is Edwin Diaz. Edwin Diaz is like really kind of turned around the narrative again he's had such an odd career where like you know he's been hated he's been loved uh he had such a good little stint in seattle the mets trade for him with in that cano deal where they send over um which prospect was it oh my god i'm blanking on which uh kelnick jared kelnick and there was a minute there when kelnick came up last year where it was like man Seattle really fleeced the Mets because uh, Edwin was pitching poorly. Cano just got suspended and Kalnick was a top five prospect. We're like, uh Oh, like Seattle fleeced them. And now Kalnick's not been playing well. And Edwin's been a top five closer in baseball for the second best team in baseball with the second best record. And New York has just like two dominant pitching staffs. And it's kind of really fun to see. Yeah. I can't wait for, uh, the Grom and Scherzer to get back, man. Yeah. Because I really want to see this Met team at full strength. 
Because if and when they implode, I at least want DeGrom and Scherzer to be there. So there's no like, oh, I wish we could have had them, all this. No, I want them to keep on doing what they're doing, and I want them to do it with two of the best pitchers in the league. Healthy. Healthy. Because it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. Especially yeah. when uh, their boys on the other side of the city are uh, balling, balling too. <laughs> balling out. A uh, little nugget, kind of a little pivot, but the uh, the Yankees are playing the uh, Cubs this week at some point, I believe. And be on the lookout for that because there was a very famous tweet that's kind of circling back around from uh, two years ago. Uh, Marcus Stroman always had has had beef with the Yankees. And he pretty much said, I wouldn't pitch for them. They need pitching. Those guys suck. I could out pitch all of them. And um, the Yankees, as a team, all their starters have a lower ERA than Marcus <laughs> Stroman. And um, I think it was Tyone and Nestor Cortez, right? We didn't include, because in this tweet, it was like only Cole's the only good one. Tyone and Nestor Cortez in their last four starts combined have less earned runs against them than Stroman had in his last outing. I just want to throw that nugget out there because I am here for Marcus Stroman slander. I want Marcus Stroman to block the spectators. <laughs> That's what I want. Marcus, I'm here for it. Block me. Both of us. Both I of us and the, and, the, and the brand account. Block us. Every one of us. Go the ahead. Whole, whole team. You're soft. The whole team. I'm always here for Marcus slander. It's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, you got anything else for us, Brook, though? No, just um, our IG been popping with a lot of news, a lot of entertainment news. So if you guys haven't heard, the sports brand, we're a sports and entertainment brand. So make sure you guys go follow us at Spectators Media on all platforms, every single one of them. Every single one of them. Go do that. Hit that follow button. Comment, like, share it to your favorite people because they want to see it too. They just don't know it yet. You haven't showed it to them yet, but show it to them because they want to see it. They want to know about the Jack Harlow KFC. They want to know. Yeah, go to KFC. Go get that. Harlow, give us a sponsor because I just gave you free clout. Okay. Free. Free 99. The Spectators Media YouTube page. Go do that. We just got a cool video. If you're a Warriors fan, go check that out. If you're a Celtic fan, be on the lookout for something. There's a lot of stuff coming up. A lot of cool things. So just follow us. That's simple. Do it. Just do it. Be on the loop. Because we can't give it to you every week. We can't tell you. We can't hold your so hand. There's a lot of stuff. I want Too much. We busy. You're a beautiful person. We busy. We love you, but we we busy. So so come on over. Join us. Uh, absolutely, Come guys. for the ride. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And we'll see you guys next Monday. Another episode 141 coming to you soon. That's Take crazy. Care, everybody brush your hair. Peace. Good.